His Excellency, Mr. Mehmet Fatih Kacır, Deputy Minister of Industry and Technology of Turkey. His Excellency, Mr. David Moran, COP26 Regional Ambassador of Europe, Central Asia, Turkey and Iran. The Right Honorable Lord Waverley, Member of the House of Lords. Mr. Chris Southworth, Secretary General, International Chamber of Commerce. Mr. John Geldart, Director General, Institute of Direct Directors, distinguished panelists and dear guests. On behalf of DAIG Turkey UK Business Council, I'm more than happy to welcome you all to today's webinar. Before I begin, I would like to extend my special thanks to His Excellency Mr. Fatih Kajer for sparing the time from his busy schedule to be with us today. On the same note, again, our heart heartfelt thanks go to His Excellency David Moran, the Right Honorable Lord Waverley, Mr. Chris Southworth, Mr. John Geldart, again, for being with us today. We are joined by distinguished speakers from Turkey and the United Kingdom, who I'm sure will contribute immensely to the dialogue. We will start the program with remarks by three important figures, Mr. John Geldart, Institute of uh, Directors, uh, the Right Honorable Lord Waverley, and Deputy Minister of Industry and Technology, His Excellency, Mr. Fatih Kajir. Afterwards, we will continue with two panels titled Transition to Green Economy, Policy Change and Challenges, and Discussion on Supply and Value Chains in Post-FTA Period. In these panels, we will be joined by leaders from government and business communities. His Excellency David Moran, COP26 Regional Ambassador for Europe, Central Asia, Turkey and Iran, will be sharing his thoughts during our first panel today. And Mr. Chris Southward, Secretary General ICC, will be providing his valuable insights during our second panel. I would like to extend my sincere thanks and gratitude to Mr. Geldart and the IOD team for their cooperation in preparing today's webinar. Last but not least, my heartfelt thanks go to Mr. Raghav Baljoğlu, board member, the Turkey UK Business Council, Deputy Gen and Deputy General Manager at Archelik, and his team, and Mr. Aycan Damalı, the Turkey UK Business Council coordinator and the DAIC team for their efforts to put this webinar together. Dear guests, we were delighted to witness Turkey's ratification of Paris, Paris Climate Ch uh, Agreement uh, recently. I find today's discussions very timely as a follow-up of COP26 event in Glasgow a few weeks ago. Though it was nice to see clear concessions made by some nations to reach a multilateral agreement, how much progress were made at the conference remains a topic of debate. But as you all know, multilateral agreements are often followed by such debates. Nevertheless, we can finally and wholeheartedly say we are at least starting to head in the right direction to combat the climate challenge. It is clear that we do not have much time to transform our economies to meet the global challenges and reach the goals set, set in, uh, in our fight against the climate change. Opportunities are likely to appear in this transformation. We have to locate and realize them to support our commerce and trade. This, when taken into consideration with the aim of promoting Turkey-UK economic relations, creates a broad area of cooperation which we can build on. The FTA that our two governments signed last, last December helped protect our strong bilateral trade and economic relations. The willingness shown by both governments to revise the agreement in the next couple of years portrays the trust and importance that our countries place in each other. The sector that we are focusing on today, electronics, is already an area of power, powerful cooperation between our two countries but there's much more that we can do to deepen those ties while fighting against the climate change and ensuring sustainability. Let me finalize my words with a warning. We don't have time to waste, we must act now. Now I'd like to turn the floor over to John Geldart, the Director General of the Institute of Directors. Mr. Geldart, thank you for being with us today and the floor is yours, please. Well, thank you very much indeed, and um, I should say I really appreciate the opportunity to say a few words, uh, particularly at this uh, important time, not only for 
the world uh, following COP, but also uh, at a time of importance between our two countries. Uh, and uh, my uh, heart goes out to the difficulties that your country has and the leadership that your country is showing in respect of the, the refugee issues that are um, uh, around your borders. This particular juncture is one which I think history will judge us on. How well did we manage the aftermath of COP26? I was privileged to attend COP and certainly saw something that I believe has not happened before, which is the detailed involvement of business at COP. And in listening to the conversations uh, in the Blue Zone and elsewhere, I was very much struck by the way that government, government officials, negotiators were turning to look to business to support them in their endeavours to move towards and keeping alive the hope of 1.5. It is undoubtedly a critical point in the history of our planet. We all know that. We can all attest to that in the changes we're seeing in our own countries as climate change takes hold in so many sometimes small ways. And of course, we see the effects of climate migration as well as uh, other effects uh, taking place around the world. It was particularly poignant for me to see at COP representatives from the Amazonian rainforests and elsewhere, from the Seychelles, from the Marshall Islands and others where climate change is so much impacting them even now on a day-to-day -day basis. So what to do? I think the opportunity really as we go forward post COP is as I said at the beginning of my speech, for business to work in concert with government, for business to be able to take up the reins of the environment in which government can create frameworks for positive change to take place. And this is across the supply chain. So the Institute of Directors in the United Kingdom represents the core of what I would term the middle market of the United Economy economy. That is those organizations between two and 200 million who really are at the heart of the supply chain, both within the United Kingdom and globally. And for many of our members in that cohort, they have one heartfelt question, which is, what can I do? In a recent poll, we found that 47% of our members actually wanted to commit, but genuinely are not sure what they can do individually and personally in their businesses. They want to do something, they have the desire to do something, they're prepared to commit to do something. But on a day-to-day -day basis, they are looking, and 51% are looking, for governments to create frameworks which will support them in their endeavours, to point them in the right direction, and to help them take the next step. For us, this is something at the heart of what the IOD do. The Institute of Directors was set up in 1903. It received its Royal Charter in 1906. And the very core of what we're about, our purpose for existence, is to improve the quality of directors in the United Kingdom and around the world. And we hope to be able to partner with other countries, with other initiatives around the world to bring into the fold to our training and our development, the skilling and upskilling of directors such that we can meet the next challenge that falls before us, and particularly at this time with climate change and supply chain difficulties. So the IOD does three things. First thing is we connect directors one to another. This event is one of our outreach programs. It's an opportunity for us to interconnect with colleagues uh, of like mind in Turkey. And the Turkish business community is the diaspora of the Turkish business community in the United Kingdom, who plays such an important role in the development of the United Kingdom, as well as of Turkey. So we connect directors one to another. And we do that across the whole of the United Kingdom and indeed, as I said, 
uh, internationally. The second thing we do is we develop directors to be the best directors we can be. We are an awarding body. We are an accrediting body. Under our Royal Charter, we are able to award our diploma and our uh, other certificates uh, to move towards the pinnacle of charter directorship in the United Kingdom. And we're in a whole series of events and seminars and courses to retrain and upskill directors, as I said, to be the best directors we can be in the sense of focusing on corporate governance and the effects of corporate governance and good corporate governance can have in the boardrooms and on the uh, onward uh, development of any individual business. So we connect directors one to another, we develop directors have the best skills they can have to be the best directors we can be. And the final thing we do is we work with government and we use the phraseology of influence. Really we are partners with government and it's a great privilege that every week we speak, and I'll be speaking this afternoon to the business secretary, Kwasi Kwarteng, and we do that as one of only five organizations that have a weekly update and discussion with the business secretary to ensure that the understanding that he has of business is well framed uh, in order that he can support business by creating the best uh, if you like, environment in which business can flourish. And we do that both at a local level across the regions of the UK, at a nation's level in Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, and at a national level with the Westminster government. So we influence government as best as we can to ensure that they set the frameworks that business uh, can flourish within. And that really brings me finally to talk about the interaction we can have with colleagues around the world and in this instance with Turkey, where we see the opportunity to create a bilateral uh, flows of both understanding as well as the investment in, in order to ensure that together we can take on some of the challenges that exist, uh, not only in terms of the aftermath of COP uh, and the green investment, which I'll talk about brief, briefly in a second, uh, but also just generally managing our supply chains, which are, are suffering in many so many ways across the United Kingdom and, uh, and internationally. The area of green finance in particular is one that is growing. We saw a huge commitment at COP, $130 trillion worth of investment, flipping towards investment in green and the future of the planet. We're seeing that in the UK as well, an increased number of banks and also other institutions, private equity, and particularly the pensions providers, thinking very carefully about where they're going to put their money in the future. And this is a core aspect of our work with government in the United Kingdom on behalf of our members. Shifting and, if you like, pivoting investment and opportunity into the green economy. It's something that the United Kingdom is very strong on, uh, the, uh, looking at hydrogen, looking at wind power and, and others, uh, and uh, sequestration of, of carbon and carbon capture. Uh, these are areas that the United Kingdom historically has had great innovation in, and many of our members are involved in across the United Kingdom from uh, wind turbine production uh, in Scotland uh, through to the, the uh, new hydrogen technologies that are occurring across the United Kingdom. So with that in mind, I would just extol viewers of this webinar to reach out to the UK, to reach out to businesses in the UK and do that through the business organizations that are not only speaking here today, uh, but the others with which you have connectivity to make sure that we are at the forefront of these changes, that we are driving the environment in which business can be better post COP and to do so not only in the interest of our planet, but also in the interest of good business and our children and our children's children's future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gazar, for your remarks. Uh, I don't know if we have uh, Lord Waverley with us yet. Uh, no, not yet. He, he has some connection issues as well, right? Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll continue with uh, His Excellency, Mr. Minister. Uh, uh, now I'd like to turn uh, uh, to, to, to him and, uh, and the floor is yours, His Excellency, Your Excellency. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, I think we, we do not have Lord Beverly yet with us and uh, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Morin, uh, dear Mr. Gellert, dear Mr. Okai, distinguished participants, I'm very delighted to be with you on the occasion of the webinar on Turkey and the United Kingdom cooperation in transition to a green economy. Allow me to express my sincere appreciation for the Foreign Relations Board, DAIC, for the excellent organization of this event, 
and I would also like to express my gratitude to all of our guests from the United Kingdom. Actually, the United Kingdom is among the first countries with which Ottoman Empire established diplomatic relations. And today, the UK and Turkey are vital trade and investment partners of each other. Together with our British partners, we are working very hard to strengthen the bilateral relations between the two allies. Brexit has been a golden opportunity for forging stronger economic ties. Both sides have shown its desire to capture this historic opportunity. Signature of the free trade agreement has removed most of the uncertainties related to the post-Brexit era. It was definite proof that the alliance between the two countries remain intact in the post-Brexit era as well. We aspire to take the trade relations much further with a new and more ambitious free trade agreement in the period to come. UK is a very critical market for our automobile, white goods and textile industries. I am also delighted to say that our trade relations have endured the challenge introduced by pandemic and shown its resilience. In a period marked by broken supply chain, shutdowns and travel restrictions, bilateral trade volume of UK and Turkey in 2020 has successfully maintained its 2019 levels, 16.8 billion US dollars in a year. Thanks to the restructuring of supply chains, we have observed a, observed a greater interest by our British partners in Turkish products. Turkish companies have leveraged this opportunity. They have proven themselves as reliable and essential trade partners, supplying high quality products to British businesses. Our exports to United Kingdom in the first nine months of this year increased by 28% relative to last year. While the bilateral trade is increasing each day, Direct investment is another pillar of the strong economic relations. UK is the third most investing country in Turkey, as the amount of direct investment from UK in the last 20 years has exceeded 12 billion US dollars. More than 3,200 British companies operate in Turkey in various sectors. These figures clearly show that our British friends believe in Turkey's potential and trust its economy. We expect the current course to continue as Turkey remains a safe harbor with tremendous opportunities for British investors. Our generous and comprehensive investment incentives minimize the upfront cost and accelerate the returns on investments for you. Our already powerful manufacturing capacity provides an opportunity to reach broad supplier base, which offers cost-effective and on-time solutions. As we are aiming for stronger economic cooperation with our British partners, our focus, is in, or our focus is on building a closer partnership in technology intensive industries and promoting the use and development of environmental sustainable technologies. We are open to all kinds of cooperation with our British counterparts serving these goals. I hope this event will serve as a platform for a better, stronger, and sure greener future in both countries. Distinguished participants, COVID-19 pandemic has not only disrupted our lives and business models, we have seen one of the largest contractions in trade and production ever. For governments and businesses, disruptions in production proved to be a difficult test for supply chains and testing the resilience of the global trade. Global economy has contracted 3.3% whereas global trade volume declined by 8.5%. In this challenging period, Turkey not only passed this difficult test, but also positively diverged from the rest of the world. Our economy grew by 1.8% in 2020, making it one of the two countries in Europe that recorded progress in 2020. Our strong manufacturing industry is the main driver of this achievement. For the future, we strive to reinforce our manufacturing capacity while maintaining its competitiveness. Our future action plan aims for increasing high value added production capacity, digital transformation of Turkish industry and creating necessary human capital, ensuring green transformation in all economic sectors. We call our efforts to transfer, transfer into a more industry and technology oriented economy, the National Technology Initiative. We implemented many strategic programs for this purpose. 
With technology-oriented industry movement program, in Turkish we call it Hamle program, we provide special end-to-end -end incentives from R&D to exports for the local production of high-tech goods. We selected 20 projects for pilot phase of the program. We are currently reviewing projects with fixed investment of 44 billion Turkish liras and 11 billion Turkish liras of R&D. These projects will clearly straighten the high-tech high -tech manufacturing ecosystem in our country. We provided the highest grant in the history of TÜBİTAK, Turkish Scientific and Technological uh, Research Council, to the development of national 5G communications network. Our locally LTE developed base stations provide uninterrupted mobile communications across the whole Turkey. We offer attractive incentives to companies in technoparks as well as to the R&D centers of the private sector. Today, more than 7,000 companies in technoparks and more than 1,600 R&D and design centers benefit from our comprehensive R&D programs. We encourage the world's leading companies to establish research labs and conduct research in frontier technologies in our country. We provide grant support for up to 75% of the all personal consultancy and general expenses. I have a message for our British friends. We do not discriminate international investors in our incentive programs. We believe that foreign investment is essential for the development and prosperity of our economy. I invite you to take the advantage of those opportunities. Distinguished guests, COVID-19 pandemic has been a strong catalyst for technology adoption, which is called the digital transformation. Fast pace of the transformation ensured that organizations could continue to operate remotely and serve their client base with digital solutions. Despite its opportunities for enterprises, pursuing digital transformation is a long journey with a lot of challenges. Many businesses fail to implement digital transformation due to lack of clarity of thought. Even if they have strong desire and clear vision, cost is a tremendous challenge, especially in today's competitive business environment. Responsible governments work side by side with business community to overcome those challenges. As the Minister of Industry and Technology, we keep digital transformation at the top of our agenda so that Turkish industries stay ahead of the curve. We have prepared the Industrial Digital Transformation Roadmap to guide us for the digital transformation journey of Turkish industry. We put pre-competitive collaboration centers at the core of our digital transformation ecosystem. We also lay out the human resources, incentive, infrastructure and governance structure that will enable the transformation. At this point, I would like to show the importance of human capital in digital transformation by numbers. By 2030, we expect that more than 7 million jobs in our country will be redundant because of digitalization and automation. However, thanks to increased productivity and digitalization, there is an opportunity to aid almost 9 million new jobs. In addition to this, new technologies can create 1.8 million new jobs so that the number of jobs in our country will be over 36 million in 10 years. This was the reason why human capital is the most important pillar of our national industry strategy. As a country with young and dynamic population, we prepare the next generation for the evolving needs of the labor market. We aim to increase the number of software developers in our country to 500,000. To train qualified software developers, we have joined a 42 coding school network, one of the best coding schools worldwide. We have recently established two coding schools. Those schools offer free education on software development to many young people. Our maker labs in Turkish Deneyap labs aim to provide the basic technology education for young people in all provinces and develop projects. Moreover, we organize world's biggest international aerospace and technology festival, Technofest, to encourage young people to meet with the new fields of technology. A number of programs are underway to reskill our workers to meet the demands of the future of work. Our model factories introduce lean production methods 
to Turkish entrepreneurs and employees. Eight of th those factories are already <coughs> operational and we plan to open seven new model factories by 2023. Together with the World Economic Forum and Turkish Employers Association of Metal Industries, we established the MEXT Center for Fourth Industrial Revolution. This center also contributes significantly to digital transformation of our industry. We hope to extend our international collaboration to our British partners. We know that enhancing the productivity of British companies and their adoption of advanced technologies are priority areas of the UK government. We wish our model factories to have close cooperation with UK's Digital Catapult, the leading authority on advanced digital technology. I'm sure both sides can learn from each other as to how to address innovation and efficiency priorities of manufacturing industries. Distinguished participants, global warming is no longer a looming threat. It's already affecting every region on earth and Turkey is not isolated from the effects of climate change. We do not have luxury to pretend business as usual. It's therefore priority of our government to organize the development policies in a way that's more sustainable and adaptable to climate change. Turkey's ratification of the Paris, Paris Climate Agreement is a major cornerstone of green transformation and green development. As a party to Paris Agreement, we aim to have zero carbon emissions by 2053. The Green Deal Action Plan published in July this year, is our new roadmap for the implementation of climate change policies. Our plan is in line with the European Green Deal. The plan will contribute to our transition to a more sustainable, resource efficient and green economy. What's our vision for green transformation? Standards and financial incentives are a key to align priorities of governments and businesses for green transformation. For this reason, we are going to restructure our investment incentives and national standards in line with the need to accelerate the green transformation. We believe successful green transformation of economy starts with, with using green inputs and sustainable product policies. Over the years, Turkey has successfully transformed its energy ecosystem and successfully transferred to renewable energy resources. Today, <clears throat> More than 53% of installed energy capacity comes from renewable resources. Thanks to incentives, renewable resources now have lion's share in new installments. We will continue to increase Turkey's renewable energy capacity. We have already adopted the EU's new energy labeling and eco-design frameworks for electrical and electronic products such as white goods, electric motors, and computers. In a world where the need for efficient use of resources increases each day, we are working towards the transition to a circular economy. We are going to announce our circular economy action plan, which will navigate our future efforts for recycling and reuse of products. Together with our private sector, we are working hard to transform our manufacturing sector to achieve green transformation. As Turkey, is one of the prime, prime manufacturing centers of automobile industry. Mobility is the leading industry for smart and green connectivity in our country. We have proudly exported new generation electrical and autonomous buses to Europe. Ford Motor Company has recently announced its 2 billion euros investment for the production for, of electrical commercial vehicles and batteries at its plants in Turkey. In this plant, Ford will be manufacturing electrical commercial vehicles for Ford Company and Volkswagen. As another pioneering project, we are developing our national electrical vehicle project, TOGG, with the cooperation of public and private sectors. These two electrical car projects will be supported by battery investments in Turkey, one of the largest investments ever made in the country. Extensive charging station network is essential to promote the use of electrical cars. We have, we have prepared a roadmap for the creation of a comprehensive charging infrastructure across the country. The roadmap includes a framework for technical standards, legislation, and support programs that will form the basis of the charging infrastructure. All those investments and projects will create sustainable, 
environmentally friendly mobility ecosystem in Turkey, around which new technologies will be developed. Our organized industrial zones ensure planned industrial development and enhance efficient use of resources. We have prepared the Green Organized Industrial Zones project to promote sustainable practices in our organized industrial zones. We have secured $300 million from the World Bank for the implementation of this project. As the government of Turkey, we have put our great efforts for mitigating the effects of climate change on our daily lives and economy. However, tackling grand challenges require coordinated, collaborative, and collective efforts. The UK hosted the 26th UN Climate Change Conference of the parties this year and led many pioneering initiatives to accelerate the transition to carbon neutral economy. It was a great platform to collectively shape global climate action strategy. With this opportunity, I would like to congratulate Ambassador David Moran and everyone who worked very hard for the successful realization of this event. As Turkey, we showed strong participation and renewed our commitment to cope with the climate change in COP26. Throughout the conference, we became one of the signatories of Glasgow Breakthroughs, a commitment to accelerate the innovation in clean technologies. We have become one of the parties to two important initiatives to accelerate the transition to zero emission vehicles. COP26 declaration on accelerating the transition to 100% zero emission cars and vans, Memor memorandum of understanding on zero emission medium and heavy duty vehicles. We are grateful that UK has acted as facilitator in the negotiation process of a deal between Turkey and the development partners. 3.1 billion US dollars provided by this financing deal will have will have a significant leverage effect in our green development. With this opportunity, I would like to express our readiness to cooperate further with the UK on green and digital transformation for, for, for the forthcoming period. As I conclude my remarks, I thank everyone for the successful, successful realization of this webinar. I hope that the event will be fruitful for all the parties and contribute to the strengthening of cooperation between our countries. Thank you very much. Uh, His Excellency, Mr. Minister, thank you very much for your insightful speech. Uh, and I second your remarks on the potential of Turkish and UK companies, uh, mainly in areas like digitalization and green technologies. And especially as being a representative of several companies established in technoparks, Turkish technoparks, I fully support your words, encouraging UK companies to come and conduct their R&D studies in Turkish technoparks where they can reach qualified personnel and enjoy the incentives at the same time. So uh, thank you very much for being with us uh, today. Uh, and, uh, and thank you very much again for your insightful remarks. Uh, now I see Lord Waverley having joined us and uh, would like to turn the floor over to Lord Waverley, member of the House of Lords. Uh, Lord Waverley, welcome, sir. And you have the floor, please. Thank you very much. and. Uh... It's a pleasure to be alongside you, Minister, and thank you for your insights with all the issues uh, relating to uh, green matters. Uh, your remarks are uh, appreciated. So a most warm welcome and salam alaikum from uh, Westminster, Minister, delegates and uh, organisers. I confess to dithering about what to offer as the principal thrust of my remarks, Naturally wishing, of course, to put best foot forward uh, for the United Kingdom, which is entering an age of optimism. Or wishing to strike a balance and focus on Turkey, as Turkey is an important and valued trading partner for the United Kingdom, is a member of NATO, and politically and strategically critical uh, to our interests with shared concerns of migration, regional instability, and defense or to offer remarks of a general nature that I trust will serve as useful background. Certain it is that Brexit uh, presents us with many opportunities to deepen the relationship. Turkey unquestionably commands influence beyond its frontiers. If we had to draw up a priority list of countries with which the UK should ally, Turkey would be in the Champions League uh, with Istanbul, for example, ranking alongside London, Dubai, Mumbai, Singapore, or Sao Paulo 
as a world-class regional hub. It is a central corridor of the Silk Road with ease of access to the Turkic countries of Central Asia and with its positive relation building in the Middle East. This provides, with Turkey's excellent infrastructure, an ideal positioning for access to the European Union, Middle East, Africa, and Central Asian markets, all of which, all of whom feel more than comfortable uh, with your country. Having called on ministers and agencies various, my visits to Turkey clearly indicate that she looks most favorably uh, towards the UK. So everything to play for, uh, for us. I cannot underline this sufficiently uh, and offer some observations. Your country has a population of 83 million, an educated population and a large pool of skilled and low cost labor with production diversification potential. The UK-Turkey trade agreement is ratified and reflects the importance that both sides place on the alliance uh, between our nations. Deeper economic cooperation can now be pursued and this should not be regarded lightly in the negotiations to come for the UK ranks second amongst Turkey's export partners. Turkey's commercial partners see an entrepreneurial trading nation of more than 80 million, half of whom are under the age of 30, with their high standard of education, excellent technical skills, and an economy that has in the past uh, shown itself capable of economic growth rates of more than 5%. Whilst our bilateral relationship is long-standing, the FTA is unfinished business, however, and signals the start of a new relationship and negotiation. I understand that talks on a more comprehensive free trade deal next year have already begun. Good news, as this will have the potential to develop new areas to strengthen commercial cooperation and beyond. For example, the current agreement did not cover services which account for 19% of the UK's trade uh, with Turkey. We should be looking to blend the strengths of the UK's expertise in the fields of investment and finance with Turkey's agricultural, manufacturing and textile industries, together with a focus on investment, subsidies, labor, sustainable development and climate. An open, innovative, comprehensive free trade, ag free trade agreement will be an essential part of the important wider relationship. We already have the UK government committing to undertake a public cons consultation on future proposals. And I look forward uh, to playing my part in, the, in, in those opportunities. These will, of course, come under scrutiny in the Westminster Parliament. Ladies and gentlemen, our gathering today also has focused on the transition to the green economy, as we have heard. There is much needed and much contribution that the private sector can involve itself. The new agenda can promote the sustainability of business strategies and the creation of new business and investment opportunities between UK and Turkey. There has been significant progress in terms of renewable energy infrastructure, product standards and compatibility of industries to EU norms. Delegates, the UK's newly released export plan has expressed commitment to the safeguarding of the environment, the fostering of a high value jobs in a low carbon economy and fueling technological innovations that can be exported around the world. A section entitled Modernizing Trade presents a vision of, and I quote, enhanced EDG that will allow for longer term financing for clean growth sector exporters. Growth by SMEs, however, crucially depend on accessing export finance. UK industry can make an impact to the goals by providing world-leading solutions and products uh, which, from the perspective of the UK, uh, are free uh, as a result of the uh, uh, European rules. Employment, innovation and trade rebalancing require capital. The internal market should be allowed to grow without over-reliance on financing from banks. Failure to raise capital for deployment in green projects has now only just begun to be addressed. So, whilst it is, so while it is essential that green bonds are raised, 
the mechanism as to how the money will find its way down for such projects is an imperative. Moving to the theme of today's conference of opportunities and challenges in the electrical and electronics sector, components and finished products. The restructuring of supply chains present new windows of opportunity for Turkey and the UK, strengthening common positions in global supply chains and trade corridors. COVID-19 uh, definitely showed us the importance of this resilience. We already share internet interconnected value chains and investments, common initiatives that can, can, can be taken to reduce the future shocks. Turkey is perfectly positioned with its geography to realize bilateral cooperation, not least taking account of increased container, transpo, tra uh, container transportation costs from China, presenting real opportunity to closer and reliable sources. In drawing to a conclusion, and in congratulating the organizers on today's discussion, uh, with wishing you all well with mutual cooperation and success, the UK and Turkey share many common interests and opportunities with a set of incentive packages and grants available with R&D, as an example, enjoying tax and social security premium incentives that offer an attractive environment. Therefore, a good bet for FDI, especially as a manufacturing base for the low carbon products we will all need in the coming years. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to say a word. Thank you very much, Lord Waverley, for your valuable remarks. And now we will proceed with our panels. Our first panel subject is Transition to Green Economy, Policy Change and Challenges. And I would like to turn to Mr. Ozan Nalcıoğlu, Engineering Director, Carbon Transition Program, leader of Fort Otosan, Turkey. Ozan Bey, you can kindly take the lead from here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Okyay. Dear participants, it's great, great uh, pleasure for me to be able to support this significant webinar uh, about cooperation between Turkey and the United Kingdom towards transition to green economy. We will now uh, discuss further on policy changes and challenges towards green economy. Uh, and it is going to be a good opportunity for our participants to listen or distinguish guest speakers. Mr. Ambassador David Moran, Mr. Andrew Griffiths, and Mr. Özkan Özkara in this panel. Uh, first, I would like to introduce His Excellency Mr. Moran, who is COP26 Regional Ambassador for Europe, Turkey, Central Asia, and Iran. Mr. Moran worked, worked closely with COP26 uh, unit and the other stakeholders to help develop regional country level uh, support for COP objectives and help to ensure uh, the delivery of COP objectives is central to our bilateral and wider regional uh, relationships with governments and businesses. Dear Ambassador, I would like to thank you and the UK team for finalizing COP26 successfully. In COP, uh, we heard most of the world is now covered with net zero commitments and also heard the powerful commitments made to redirect finance. And there has been crucial steps taken to drive down emissions on different sectors, other than energy and carbon as well. And uh, it's first time announcement of climate deal plans to reduce coal. Uh, although there was a small change in the, in the text last minute. Uh, could you please evaluate the main outcomes of COP26 for us? Yes, of course, I'd, I'd be delighted. Uh, hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to join you today, and I'm grateful to DEIK for this opportunity. Uh, Turkey was <laughs> one of the first, was the first country that I visited, along with Alok Sharma, the COP president, after it became possible to resume traveling earlier this year. Uh, the constructive discussions that we had with your government and businesses laid the foundation for our fruitful collaboration in Glasgow. Uh, this is my first speaking event since uh, COP26, and I'm still reflecting on, on the achievements and the implications, but some moments, Turkey-related, particularly stand out. 
I was in the UK seat when the COP plenary formally recognized Turkey's ratification of the Paris Agreement. Uh, during the, uh, the two weeks uh, when, when I wasn't uh, busy with bilateral meetings, uh, I enjoyed visiting the Turkish pavilion. And on the final day, it was a real pleasure to hear Turkey's very constructive closing intervention. Ours is a partnership that will certainly continue as this event, and especially the Deputy Minister's speech, clearly show. COP26 rightly dominated the world news. And some of you were... Um, I would like to share the perspective uh, of somebody who's on the UK presidency team, and of course, looking forward a little bit as well. I believe that uh, the Glasgow Climate Pact is the most significant outcome since the, climate, uh, since the Paris Agreement. There was consensus on urgency, urgently accelerating climate action. Uh, and as, as you mentioned, Mr. Moderator, there was no denying the deep disappointment of many around the world over the weakening of the language on coal on the final day. But it was striking that delegations were determined to protect the language and, or the package with its many strengths and the historic reference to the need to move out of coal to clean energy. Uh, we started to plan our, our presidency in 2019 and two things were clear from that start. More than ever, people would demand high ambition and inclusivity. Countries, businesses, and ordinary people insisted on urgent climate action, which kept the 1.5 uh, degree target alive. So aiming for consensus at the lowest common denominator uh, was never going to be acceptable. Many governments, including Turkey, generously invested time on building mutual understanding with us and other partners. And I think that was really important in, in uh, the eventual success. So we responded by setting four strategic priorities uh, for Glasgow, securing commitments to cut emissions dramatically, a much greater focus on supporting adaptation work, protecting nature and vulnerable people, unlocking much more public and private finance and involving a wide cross section of society in the process. And there was lots of listening during the first week of the conference. And halfway through COP26, we circulated a list of bullet points, ambitious elements that countries and other stakeholders, like business, had told us that they wanted. Now, the reaction to this list of, of bullet points was generally positive, and these were used to shape the final text. Now, as usual, no one got everything they wanted. But in the end, 100 and 97 countries and other parties to the convention agreed the text and it isn't perfect, but we were able to move forward on all the mandates that we've been given. And achievements include on emissions, a stronger commitment to limit global, global temperature rises to 1.5 degrees and, uh, and the acknowledgement of the latest science. So it, to keep 1.5 alive, countries should now revisit their 2030 emission reduction targets next year and where necessary strengthen them to bring them in line with the Paris Agreement temperature goal. In this way, Glasgow accelerates the ratchet mechanism in the Paris Agreement, requiring countries to review the science and adapt their commitments appropriately. And finance, absolutely critical. Countries agreed to report on progress towards achieving the $100 billion goal, continue discussions on long-term finance, and begin the process of setting a new collective quantified goal for post-2025. There's progress on unlocking public and private sector finance, which we've been looking for, not least through Mark Carney's headline announcement that John referred to of over $130 trillion of capital committed to net zero through the Glasgow Financial Alliance for net zero. Now, developing countries wanted much more funding 
for adaptation and loss and damage. And the Glasgow Climate Fact Pact calls for developed countries to at least double from 2019 levels their collective provision of climate finance for adaptation to developing countries by 2025. COP26 also saw record finance raising efforts for the adaptation fund of all of over $350 million and contributions to the least country de uh, developed country fund reached $600 million. These, these are significant increases in available capital. Now, delegates understandably gave new prominence to loss and damage, raising its profile to a standalone issue. And that will continue now forever. And agreeing the functions and funding arrangements for the Santiago network on loss and damage. Now, many countries were disappointed by the lack of a consensus on the creation, uh, creation of a dedicated loss and damage financing facility, but the new Glasgow Dam Dialogue will look at how to increase available funds and ease access by those in need. After six years, we finally finalized the detailed rules and systems to underpin pin, uh, delivery under the Paris Agreement. Not very glamorous, but absolutely central through consensus on an enhanced transparency framework, common, common time frames for reporting and Article 6, Glasgow makes reporting, monitoring and evaluation more effective. Our homework will be graded. Finally, Glasgow's uh, uh, delegates agreed a new 10 year work plan uh, and program on action for climate empowerment to strengthen climate education, training public awareness, public participation, public asset access to information and international cooperation. It recognizes youth as critical agents of change and creates a permanent youth forum following the Youth for Climate event held by Italy at the pre-COP. Now this is a milestone. Even with the COVID restrictions, there were large numbers of representatives of civil society, young people and indigenous peoples present. And this will only get stronger in future. Now one thing I'd like to uh, make clear at this point is that the pact, the written text, was only part of the COP26 outcomes. There were theme days on finance, energy, adaptation, gender, youth, and others. And the UK presidency launched a number of declarations and statements on issues ranging from forest and land use to coal and clean power. Consensus was not required, so in these areas, higher ambition was possible. And that, made, that matters because the hardest part is yet to come. In my speeches these last few months, I've called for three things, commitment, ambition, and delivery. There's been some of all three, but as Alok Sharma said, 1.5 degrees is still in reach, but the pulse is weak. Expert think tanks have confirmed that our progress in setting net zero goals sets out a potential pathway for avoiding the worst climate impacts. However, we still must do much more on ambition and delivery. The need for urgent action remains. Many countries have long-term strategies, but insufficient short-term commitments to get there. Now, some countries do that because they like to under-promise and then later over-deliver. But in too many cases, the NDC's short-term commitments, I'm afraid, are just too weak. The latest UN assessments say that even if all countries implement their uh, commitments, Emissions will still rise by 2030. This can't be allowed to happen. All countries, even ambition ones, should review and enhance their NDCs in 2022. And Turkey's very welcome Paris Agreement ratification and the announcement of your 2053 net zero target leave you well placed to contribute future to global climate action. Ambition element, uh, the adaptation ambition is of great importance too. Uh, Turkey's among many countries which are highly vulnerable to the adverse impacts of climate change. And I have to say your many friends abroad were deeply saddened 
by the damage that you suffered from severe forest fires, fires and uh, floods and, and droughts over the last year. Now the UK and British companies, it's already been said, will be there to support you throughout 2022 and beyond. The Climate Finance Accelerator program that we launched in Turkey in June is just one recent example of our partnership. With this program, we aim to strengthen the ground for financing low emission projects and improving Turkey's climate finance. Ambition and delivery also send strong signals to business on the green transition. Governments would do well to work in hand with the private sector to pull together policies to deliver short and long-term goals. The key elements are clear long-term political direction, a well-designed and predictable regulatory framework, and a constructive and sensitive approach to social aspects, including uh, retraining, new employment opportunities and subsidies to encourage people to uh, adopt greener te technology, such as uh, buying electric vehicles. COP initiatives such as the Energy Transition Council and the Race to Zero, which I do uh, recommend uh, businesses, are still available to manage the wider shift to green power. And Turkey's endorsement for the Glasgow breakthroughs that uh, the Deputy Minister referred to and the zero emissions uh, vehicles uh, statement are highly positive for further engaging the private factor and more effective delivery. Many businesses, of course, are ahead of some of their countries in seeing the economic, commercial and social opportunities in proactive climate action. Turkish businesses are no exception in this regard. Sustainability is already a key agenda item for some leading businesses there. Uh, some have also joined Race to Zero and reaffirmed their commitments. You have a central role in driving further ambition, both at home and in other countries where you are active. Turkey's position as a regional trading power and potential as a major green manufacturing hub give you considerable influence in a region particularly vulnerable to climate change impacts. And your work on renewables is especially impressive. In closing, our deep bilateral commercial relationship goes a long way and it's no accident that our regional trade and investment center is in Istanbul. I will say with confidence that the potential for UK collaboration on the green economy extends far beyond our borders. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Moran. Uh, would you please also elaborate uh, the achievements and what are really next steps of COP26 to keep one and a half degrees target alive? Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, I perhaps I can talk a little bit more about uh, some of the the elements that I've mentioned in passing, and and um, uh, some of the principles around uh, COP26 that were some of them came from the Paris Agreement, uh, some of them are new. Uh, the preamble and principles uh, quite often are bits that people don't read but they're so important because they they set out um the philosophy uh behind which uh, the world will tackle climate action so uh, a commitment to sustainable recovery from uh, covid uh, not locking into to dirty uh fuel but but going to clean um clean technologies and and the solidarity with vulnerable partners and the importance of, of protecting biodiversity, which, which uh, has been made um, more explicit. And of course, linking into human rights and, and rights of indigenous people. Uh, the other thing is, and this has surprised me slightly, is that in previous COPs, it had been difficult to negotiate a welcome for the scientific, uh, a welcome for the scientific um, evidence. Uh, sorry, there's, there's something in the chat to say there's a problem hearing me. Is, is, can you hear me still? Yes, we do. Okay, I think Bill Smith may have, may, may have lost uh, access. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll continue, sorry. 
and, and then new language, uh, the facing down of unabated coal power and references to the inefficient fuel subsidies. This has not been in any subsequent, uh, the previous 25 COPs. Now it's in, we can use it again, and it's an extra lever. And there's uh, a, the ratchet mechanism, I would, I would uh, enlarge on that, parties who haven't submitted new NDCs should do so, they're asked to do so before next year. Uh, and there will be uh, annual assessments and a leaders summit in 2023. Um, and um, in terms of, of uh, next steps, uh, what could have done, been done more? Well, countries could have been braver. And I think some, some countries set their ambitions at what they knew they could deliver. Actually, there were others, and I think that they were right, who looked at the economic potential, looked at the speed of technological developments, looked at the way in which politics, uh, with a small p, in other words, the way in which young people and, and stakeholders and shareholders and, and customers look at the world. Um, and they have gone for greater ambition, not just what we know we can do now, but what we can reasonably assume we can achieve by 2030. And I think that's what we need to do uh, over the next year. The UK presidency is just starting and uh, our role um, uh, beyond handing over to Egypt uh, uh, at the next COP is going to be trying to op operationalize all of the commitments that were made in Glasgow. In other words, working with you and other countries uh, and businesses and other stakeholders uh, to <clears throat> turn commitments into, into action. Uh, and that's where some of these statements will be very helpful because they go far further than the text in the main pact, but they can be used to uh, accelerate, accelerate um, uh, action. And then finally, uh, we can all be climate champions. Turkey can help by being a, a champion of, of the merits of moving to a green economy uh, in all the forums that you operate, not just business ones, but political ones like the G20. And of course, in terms of uh, helping others, uh, including in, in society to make the links between the things they're worried about, these climate uh, weather events, and the fact that it's related to climate change, and this is where uh, climate empowerment, uh, that agenda is very important. And I'd like to just close with um, uh, my remarks with just um, uh, pointing to the work of the British Council in Turkey, which does a lot on uh, climate education and uh, support. Thank you. Uh... I have the last question about Glasgow Climate Pact and several initiatives uh, accepted at COP will guide the countries to improve their green uh, economy transition. Uh, how, how do you see the transition in the region and what are the areas that we can further collaborate? Um. I, it depends. I think the answer to that depends on how we define the region. And, and Lord Waverley uh, painted a, a 360 degree picture uh, with Turkey in the center, which is, is totally accurate. If I can perhaps take one example, and it's the one that uh, he and I know best, uh, Central Asia. Uh, I think Turkey and Britain have, have a really good synergy in helping countries, uh, uh, several of whom in that region, have uh, ambition uh, to change their, their approach, but uh, face you know, fossil fuel dependencies and other challenges, which make it rather daunting and also capacity building. Um, and so uh, when I, what I would say is, um, uh, from my time as ambassador to Kazakhstan uh, 10 years ago, I remember the very active collaboration between British and Turkish companies in the, the area of um, building efficiency, uh, energy efficiency in buildings. I know uh, that it will have broadened since then, 
And I'm absolutely confident that we have uh, enormous capacity across our shared expertise, not just in renewables, but in terms of finance uh, provision uh, to, to collaborate. So uh, for me, the sky's the limit. Uh, Turkish, British uh, collaboration uh, is uh, something that I think the scope is really wide. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. It was great to hear the COP outcomes directly from yourselves. Thank you. Uh, now I would like to introduce you, Mr. Andrew Griffiths, Chair of National Sustainable Task Force in IOD, the Institute of Directors. Uh, Mr. Griffiths, we have a good collaboration between UK and Turkey in terms of trade in electric and electronic sector. What would you recommend us to improve trade in the sector while we reduce our carbon emissions? And would you also please elaborate on the impact of Brexit in terms of green transition? Do you, do you have studies uh, on adopting European Green Deal? Uh, hi, Ozan, thank you for that. And uh, it's lovely to be here and meet everybody. Um, and I've seen various people in the chat uh, messaging in where they're tuning in from. But if, if more people want to do that, it's good to get a sense of who we're talking to, because then I can hopefully make my responses as relevant as possible to what uh, people want to hear about. Um, so I, I wear a couple of different hats. I, I chair the Institute of Directors National Sustainability Task Force, uh, but I'm also a director of an organization called Planet Mark who support organizations on their sustainability journeys. Um, and I'm gonna start with the second question first and work my way back around the impact of Brexit on the green transition um, and, and how the UK may align or, or uh, sort of adapt to the EU Green Deal. And the first thing I would say is that I think as, uh, as we've seen from COP26, there's no such thing as a, um, sus a, a sustainable country as an island by itself. It's not, emissions have no borders. <laughs> um, and as, as a consequence, we cannot operate in isolation when it comes to things like sustainability and emission reductions. It has to be something where there is international collaboration. It's, it really is an issue which provides us with an opportunity really to unite uh, ourselves as, as a people and a planet in a way that few other issues ever have. Um, and so I, I hope we'll see much much more of that and so I certainly would hope to see ways in which the UK I, I've, I personally would feel must align as much as possible with the EU Green Deal or as we've seen in a number of cases go beyond um, so there are a couple of um, sort of examples from that from the UK Environment Bill where the UK is already going ahead of where the um, EU, EU Green Deal is at the moment so for example charges for single-use plastic items are coming in um, introducing powers to stop exports of plastic as well, uh, of plastic waste specifically, um, to developing countries. Is, it, powers are being brought in under the Environment Bill that was voted through very, very recently. Uh, and so there are a number of, uh, of things within that. The second thing I would welcome from the EU Green Deal in particular is the, the Just Transition Mechanism. Um, and we've heard already just from, from David about the importance of just transition has played within the COP26 negotiations at a much larger international level, but we've seen that within the EU Green Deal and indeed in conversations with uh, the UK government as well. So we're wanting to see um, mechanisms which recognise that there has to be a representative and inclusive approach to the development of emission standards and emissions reductions in all industries. Um, but electronics obviously has, uh, and technology has a massive role to play um, in this. And so, you know, that, so in terms of coming on to sort of the first question, so the impact of Brexit, if the UK chooses to act in isolation, then it's a negative impact because sustainability and emissions cannot be addressed in isolation. They have no borders. So, um, my hope will be, and what I do think we're, we're seeing in terms of the, you know, what we've seen over recent months, particularly around COP26, with the UK leading the COP26 summit, generally speaking, I, I do think the UK government are doing a range of very effective things to try and lead in this space and align with what others are doing internationally and, and really work at an international level to um, ensure that we're all working together, not just with the EU, but also far beyond. Um, and I hope we'll see more of that. And I hope we'll see 
you know, where people sort of talked about, well, Brexit might lead to the UK watering down certain environmental regulations to compete. Um, I hope that what we've heard from uh, ministers will be true, which is that actually it will be a race to the top, not a race to the bottom. I will see more desire to sort of have stringent regulation and legislation that sets a clear roadmap, which is what business leaders fundamentally need. Um, regulation, you know, can often get a, a bad name, but it's not a bad thing. And leaders generally in conversations I'll have recognised that what they want is clarity and consistency um, so they can actually plan for something. And I think a really good example of that, um, which sort of comes on to the sort of what does good collaboration look like in terms of regulatory frameworks and, and ensuring sort of alignment between Turkey and the UK, a really good example of a roadmap being developed for an industry is in transportation. So, our, you know, all of our manufacturers in transportation are under no illusion as to what the push from government is. By 2030, all petrol and diesel cars in the UK sales have to be, uh, will, will be eliminated. No new sales of petrol and diesel. By 2035, hybrid vehicles be gone. And in the recent announcement uh, just uh, last week, no, two weeks ago, on Transport Day of COP26 was that there is now a 2040 deadline for sales of uh, heavy goods vehicles that are petrol or diesel in the UK. Now, those are quite far targets that are operating quite far in advance, but the beauty of them is it allows business leaders to adapt in advance. So we're already seeing things moving much faster than that because once industry has been set a you know, the, the, a direction and a line of sight has been set in a particular direction. Industry is very, very good at picking up the baton, running with it faster than the regulation actually necessitates. And so um, with Planet Mark, we've recently done a tour of the UK uh, in the build up to COP26 in partnership with the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy and the United Nations. We have partners with the Race to Zero that was mentioned before. Um, and people are... Um, the transport industry. So we visited some manufacturers of buses, uh, long-standing manufacturers. So most buses in London are, are manufactured in Northern Ireland, for example. And the manufacturer there, the Wright Bus Company, they forecast that this year, 30% of their production of buses will have been zero emission, either electric or hydrogen, 30%. Next year, they're forecasting 70%. Bang, flipping that fast, that that quickly and the reason for that is that the economic imperatives are flipping because longer term assets like a bus which depreciates over a 15 year period um whilst the upfront cost of an electric or hydrogen bus right now are much higher over the lifespan of the vehicle when you factor in uh, the cost of fuel the cost of pollution the cost of carbon they reckon in 10 or 15 years time it will no longer be viable potentially for people to, particularly public transport companies, to have these kinds of buses on the road. And so we spoke with the CEO of Translink in Northern Ireland, who, who they look after most of the public transportation network there. And their CEO, Chris Conway, confirmed for us and said, yeah, we reckon that this year or next year will be the last year that we ever put in an order for a diesel bus. So the 2040 has been set as the target for HGVs. And yet industry is moving ahead of that because a really clear signal has been sent by regulation. This is the direction of travel. The fastest to get there will do the best, <laughs> essentially. And so that's what we'll start to see across of other areas. And so I think in terms of the calls to action for um, industry representatives to improve trade between Turkey and the UK, um, there is already a great deal of trade. Um, particularly in electronics between Turkey and the UK. I myself have a background in electronics. I spent two years working at an organization called Astute Electronics. We do a lot of business with uh, Aselzan, Vestal, and other sort of large defense uh, sort of industry contractors and, and uh, sort of for creation of, of products. And so a lot of a lot of stuff is already going on. And I had a call with the CEO, Jeff Hill, just before I came onto this uh, webinar today to get his view on, on Brexit and on <laughs> the green transition and things. I think one of the major things that the electronics industry has in its favor is that it's already quite a, a it's quite a well-regulated industry, uh, but also there are some existing uh, standards around traceability that lend quite well towards a transition um, in terms of becoming more sustainable and tracking carbon footprints and stuff. So particularly for high reliability um, industry sort of areas, traceability is a long held standard 
really well governed, really well where sort of electronic components move through the supply chain with their certificates consistently in a way that most other industries do not in terms of products. And so actually, when you think about it, starting to build in things like carbon footprinting of products can largely just be added on to existing certification mechanisms to give that transparency, give that, that view on the supply chain. Um, that, that were these were initially brought in largely, I guess, because of anti-counterfeiting measures um, and sort of and you know reliability measures, but actually they can be adopted quite smoothly, relatively speaking, for tracking carbon through the supply chain. And the opportunity when you do that, we certify hundreds of organizations for carbon reduction and the creation of um, social value. And once you start measuring something, people naturally start working on it. So we've seen in 2019, pre-COVID, of the hundreds of organizations that we certify, on average, they reduced their absolute carbon emissions by 12%. Last year, with COVID, it was 24% reduction in, within a one-year period. So people are taking large action because fundamentally, we've got to manage our carbon in the same way as we would manage our finances. If you can you imagine us managing our finances you know your cfo comes to you and says i want you to save money in my budget i want you to cut some costs um i don't want you to measure anything i don't want you to set any targets i just want you to come up with a list of things that we could do to cut our costs and that's what we'll give to our investors and they'll be very pleased with us no <laughs> you have to you, you we can't you can't manage what you don't measure and you can't put uh, put a progress towards something you haven't set a target for. And so the thing I would urge um, industry representatives to be doing is to seek a um, representative and an inclusive approach to development, talk to your employees at all levels of the, the business. They, the solutions almost always already exist at a ground level. People are already aware of what you could be doing. The second is to lean on existing regulation to forge a path for industry. So industry will move ahead of regulation particularly when there has been a clear industry signal sent to say, this is the direction of travel, get started. So there will be, you know, I love the metaphor of the race to zero. It is a race. There are going to be winners and there are going to be losers. There are going to be our blockbusters and there will be our Netflixes. So people embracing it will gain competitive advantage by doing so and already are. If you, if you haven't started already, you're already behind the curve and the rug could get pulled very, very quickly. Um, so getting ahead of the curve is, is critical. And for regulators, uh, we want to see uh, just setting those really clear long term signals to industry saying this is where it's going to go. Stuff around the circular economy, stuff around uh, sort of waste, uh, you know, electronic components and, and the expectations around circularity. Setting those long term things really helps industry get there. Um, but for those who are already leaning in and already leading the way, um, there are huge opportunities ahead. And uh, I, I, you know, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to chuck them in the chat um, or follow up with me on LinkedIn or something. Um, but broadly, that's that's what we're seeing uh, is it, you know, there are huge opportunities and those who move ahead of the curve will benefit greatly. And there are other sort of like what, another what important thing to, to reference, if you work at all with a client or a supplier or someone who is working with UK government contracts, whether it be in defence or healthcare or public bodies and construction, there's new changes that have been made to UK legislation, whereby any public procurement worth more than £5 million, you have to have a net zero strategy or you can't even bid. And as a result, we're seeing people like Microsoft and Salesforce have now written into every single one of their supplier contracts. You must have a net zero strategy within the next couple of years or we will not buy from you. Tesco's uh, major um, UK sort of supermarket sent out a, an email to all of their suppliers four weeks ago before COP saying we need your carbon footprint by the end of the year. We need you to have a net zero target by the end of next year. And we need you to have a science based target with a 50 percent reduction by 2030 by the end of 2023. And by the way, if you haven't switched to renewable energy supply already, do it. Um, these ripple effects are coming out now. And so those who get ahead of the curve are going to do very, very well because they won't panic when they receive that email. They'll go brilliant. Yes, here's everything we've already done rather than, oh, no, <laughs> I've got to figure something else out here now. But hopefully that's useful.
Okay, thanks a lot, Andrew. It was pleasure to listen uh, to your point of view. Thank you. Uh, now our next speaker is for the panel is Mr. Özkan Özkara, who is uh, the industry expert at Ministry of Industry and Technology of the Republic of Turkey. Uh, dear Mr. Özkara, uh, as a representative of the uh, ministry, could you please tell us about your work and trends around transition to green economy? How will Turkey adapt to the changing system and what are the strategies in order to sustain fair transmission? Uh, we know that Turkey has a Green Deal action plan to adapt its production to the uh, European Green Deal. Also, we know that electric and electronic sector, environmental friendly production and energy efficiency regulations of appliances are already in line with a European equis. Uh, can you please expand on the regulatory work that you are conducting currently and share your comments how this level can contribute to improve collaboration between UK and Turkey regarding decarbonized production and clean supply chain? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Nalcıoğlu. I have a presentation, uh, if possible. Uh, I will try to... Uh, it's okay? Uh, sure. Uh, okay, just a minute. It's okay, I think. Uh, yes, we can see. Uh, yes, uh, thank you again. Uh, I will try to answer your questions in my presentation. Uh, Dear participants, I am uh, greeting you on behalf of my ministry and I would like to introduce myself uh, firstly. I'm Oskar Oskar and I'm an uh, expert in, uh, at uh, Ministry of Technology uh, and I will briefly uh, inform you about uh, our legislative change uh, in the transition to uh, green economy and the difficulties in these regards. Uh, during the, my presentation, I will try to give detailed information about not only and but also uh, the general perspective and uh, this uh, I have planned my presentation under the five headings uh, first of all I will tell you about the targets and uh, give uh, information about the position of the electric electronic industry here uh, then I will give information about our policies uh, legislation making and our difficulties respectively uh, and I will summarize my presentation in the last part by giving uh, information on this subject under the title of Turkey and the collaboration of uh, between collaboration between uh, you, Turkey and UK uh, and uh, the targets uh, let uh, well until the world uh, uh, became aware of the climate crisis we obviously cared about energy efficiency in consumers and users the truth behind this the reduction in energy bills and the and uh, uh, bills of end users obviously everyone sees that uh, this is no longer valid. Uh, thus, uh, the need to uh, establish an end-to-end uh, system with new regulations and new approaches arises. Uh, and uh, I don't, uh, we can't multiply, multiply examples here, uh, but uh, a lot of countries and regions and also corporations uh, has uh, have explained the targets about uh, uh, about their uh, transition uh, green economy and we see uh, a convergence uh, in terms of uh, the zero carbon and reduce, reducing emissions between the countries uh, and corporations also and today we are talking about uh, the two parts uh, except end users, energy generation and distribution and manufacturing. I, I actually say that this area in Turkey is non-regulative area now. And uh, so uh, this uh, process with the new policies and application rules on the basis of the environmental awareness. Uh, so uh, these are, uh, we are, uh, working on this area to regulate uh, uh, for uh, tra uh, uh, for transition to green economy and these are very important for us and uh, but uh, therefore we actually uh, 
mainly targeting the electrification all the parts and uh, so the electric equipment sector is the center of the displays with its subsectors and new policies and new rules uh, to uh, for the green economy directly affect our sectors uh, not only turkey but also in uh, uh, in the world. Uh, so uh, this is uh, our main uh, perspective to improve our uh, electric, electric sectors uh, with uh, new uh, legislation uh, and implementation. Uh, so we are, uh, so nowadays we talk about the green uh, economy and uh, carbon trade uh, on electric electric sector. If you look at the how the st steps that will ensure the development of our sector, we see that this structure, uh, uh, in general, first of all, we see, uh, we cooperate uh, the structure that construct and incorporate environmental sensitive structures. Then new legal regulations are made both under these uh, related institutions or uh, other institutions also. And then we see the clearly laid out uh, legislation regulating the industry or other sectors and the market. Uh, in the end, according to this legislation, the transition, transition of the market has taken uh, place. Actually, these states are basically the methods applied by all countries in the, uh, in the transition to green economy. And this is our main uh, legislation pro uh, process. Uh, our deputy ministry has, has uh, at the beginning of the webinar, uh, has been set, has said, uh, we are uh, uh, analyzing the uh, economic and eco uh, ecological, the new policies and new areas. And finally, we give the uh, incentives uh, and we uh, set uh, new institutions. Also, we give, uh, we try to uh, a new investment area uh, to establish and uh, to build a new infrastructure. And this is the uh, main our uh, policy and legislative process in Turkey uh, diagram. Uh, but we are also challenges. Uh, uh, to, to, there are uh, many challenges to overcome in this process. Uh, under five headings. First of all, uh, we need to pay attention to environmental risks. Uh, then, uh, uh, then uh, to sustain a technological change, to improve the, uh, also to convert the new uh, green economy uh, world. And finally, uh, to uh, provide funds or uh, some credits uh, to uh, set the new uh, business area. And also, uh, according to these uh, developments, uh, we uh, published new uh, the policy or uh, new rules. And finally, uh, we uh, measure the uh, impacts and uh, concerns from the sectors. These are our uh, challenges uh, in Turkey. Uh, also, uh, uh, Turkey has an advantage, especially in the regulated area, because it's a member of customs union. If you look at the Turkey in particular, uh, uh, to, uh, you, uh, European Union uh, shortens the process in terms of uh, technical legislation specific to products. For example, our ministry made the necessary regulations on eco design and energy labeling and put them into enter into enter into force simultaneously with uh, European Union uh, last March. However, we while fulfilling the uh, requirements of the uh, green economy raw material supply and energy demand issues. Also production side remain incomplete, uh, I have mentioned. Uh, and uh, so this debt area has been still unregulated and we believe that it should be uh, productive to uh, find new uh, green solution in Turkey. Uh, and also this area is a co collaborative area for uh, uh, international uh, improvements. Uh, it's uh, the main our uh, 
uh, legislation process depends on the European Union. Uh, so uh, uh, also the free trade agreements and uh, Paris Climate Agreement uh, with uh, European Green Deal is a uh, milestone for our uh, green, uh, green economy transition. And finally, in the uh, in coming period, uh, policy changes are expected in Turkey in the fields of energy, public procurement, smart production, building energy performance, mobility, and recycling in line with uh, European Union uh, Green Deal. And uh, this area also uh, uh, a lot of investments and uh, supports uh, are included in our plans and programs is uh, pl uh, expected to ensure uh, sustainability with structural change and support. Uh, for energy, uh, smart grids, microgrids, uh, and uh, renewable energy uh, production, also uh, renewable energy uh, uh, equipments are very important for us. Uh, green public uh, uh, procurement, uh, it's a, a general concept because uh, the products uh, are uh, aligned with the eco-design requirements. So uh, to, to contribute to green uh, tra uh, transformation, public pro uh, pro uh, procurement is a uh, important role uh, to uh, improve our electric uh, electronic sectors uh, in particular uh, industry also service we need to uh, need to turn to smart system in order to, to uh, ensure uh, energy efficiency so especially in uh, SMEs in Turkey fundamental changes are uh, uh, are uh, starting to uh, uh, starting to uh, transform their uh, green uh, production. Uh, also, uh, building energy performance is very important in, in terms of lightning, heating, and cooling system, and management of the uh, uh, new uh, building uh, designs. Uh, and finally, uh, the mobility is very important factor uh, because all the things uh, are depending on uh, the mobility and battery uh, production and battery management system is uh, very uh, complicated and uh, non-regulated area in Turkey to uh, improve our uh, sector and forward our sector to uh, new uh, study uh, areas. Uh, and recycling and recovery uh, is uh, aligned with the European Union uh, to approximately, but uh, the new investments and uh, uh, uh, new legislation uh, are planned in the future. So, uh, uh, and uh, also, excuse me. Also, uh, these are, uh, are uh, to sum up, the aims of our countries in the transition to green economy are similar to other countries, uh, actually. For this reason, under the four main headings, as seen on the slide, uh, uh, we can exploit the transition to green economy with the development of new strategies, development of uh, new legislation and policies, uh, especially in the unregulated area with the contributions of our sector between Turkey and the United Kingdom. Finally, I'd like to state that uh, our minister is ready to work together with the United Kingdom on this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Oskara, for the valuable presentation. Now, our first panel is finished, and I would like to hand over to Mr. Raghup Balcıoğlu for the rest of the webinar. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. The first panel is finished. Uh, also, our time is uh, uh, finished as well, actually, with the scheduled time, I suppose. Uh, it has been very valuable sites. Thank you very much. Um, for those of you uh, who can stay, uh, can find out on supply chain and uh, supply and value chains in the post-FTA period, uh, especially from a sustainable point of view. So, dear participants and speakers, I want to welcome you all to our panel. 
today we had the opportunity to listen to lots of insights from our distinguished speakers on the transition to green economy, diving into uh, policy changes and challenges ahead. The Glasgow Climate Pact is an important outcome of COP26 towards an accelerated action plan. In this regard, we heard valuable insights uh, from His Excellency Mr. Moran in the previous panel. And thank you for your leadership and your uh, valuable, valuable views on climate change and the recent developments in climate policy. Over the past two years, our world has changed dramatically. Um, we have covered a decade worth of change literally in months in global economic landscape. We have been facing challenges like massive disruption in global supply chains and dramatic cost increases. In the meantime, the global understanding of sustainability has certainly transformed and grown. Efforts to achieve long-term sustainability goals and reach a climate neutral world have accelerated. Thanks to the UK's effort, the COP26 has made important progress in a number of areas with major countries making the commitment to shift away from coal and subsidies for fossil fuels. It has been an important reminder to pursue efforts to limit warming to one and a half degrees if we want to, to have our kids and grandchildren uh, a livable world. European Union's Green Deal is a critical step of the carbon neutrality set for 2050, putting the climate efforts at the heart of the policy framework. The pandemic has brought forward the importance of sustainability being integrated into supply chain design and built into long-term resilience. Today, we are going to evaluate how Turkey and the UK can further cooperate to increase the supply links and the resiliency in these volatile, volatile times. There's certainly a great opportunity for both countries due to massive supply and cost disruptions happening particularly in Far East. So um, I'm very delightful to be joined by distinguished speakers to discuss supply and value chains in post FDA period. Uh, Mr. Chris Southworth, Secretary General, International Chamber of Commerce, United Kingdom. Mr. Bill Smith, Specialist Advisor, Advanced Manufacturing Sector, Department for International Trades, uh, United Kingdom. And Mr. Jan Dinchar, President, White Goods Manufacturers Association of Turkey. And Mr. Kerem Özdoğan, Board Member, Turkish Electrics and Electronics Exporters Assembly. TAT. And uh, can I ask, please, all presenters uh, to be mindful of uh, the limited time that is uh, uh, left or we have and uh, keep uh, the answers and presentations uh, very efficient, if I should say so. Thank you very much. And Mr. Southworth, um, thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, my question is that International Chamber of Commerce is presenting 45 million companies employing 1 billion people in over 100 countries. That's very impressive. In this respect, you are closely following international trade developments by also providing the rules and standards that govern international business. As Turkey is a part of the Customs Union and also a an uh, European Union candidate, can we hear your comments about how would the, how would the business rela relations between UK and Turkey change after the Brexit? Considering the supply chain restructuring discussions, what are the opportunities and possible threats awaiting the business community and their investment in the short and the medium term? Well, thank you very much. It's a privilege to have the opportunity to come and talk today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more broadly than just the EU, because I think there's an opportunity uh, that we're certainly advocating for globally. But I think Turkey and the UK have real potential uh, to play a big part in that. Um, so the, the, co the context, I've been listening to previous speakers, and I think this is very relevant to the context in which this, the speakers prior to me were, were, were talking. And the, the context is really, for me, about making trade easier for SMEs. So let's just, you know, Put, put the actual trade opportunities aside for one second. How do we actually make that trading environment easier? And when I say easier, I mean cheaper and I mean less complex, simpler, faster, quicker, cheaper. You know, that, that's the, the critical priority. So globally, we have a real problem in the sense that we have made huge progress in digitalizing customs and trade facilitation processes. Most of the European Union, uh, countries like Turkey, 
you know, much, much of the world has made big progress in that area. But we cannot digitize the trade ecosystem until we digitize what's called transferable records. And th those are the documents that refer to the, the exchange of goods, uh, bills of exchange, bills of lading, promissory notes, warehouse receipts. Those are almost entirely dealt with in paper form globally. There are only six countries that are able to deal with those in digital form, and neither one of those is the UK or Turkey, although the UK will be able to, I'm pleased to say, midway through 2020 with a new electronic trade documents bill. So what's the problem? The problem is quite simple. We are just dealing with really antiquated legal systems, and those legal systems don't talk to each other, which doesn't allow companies to bring solutions, technology solutions and innovation at scale across borders. And that becomes a real problem when you're trying to bring more SMEs into the trading system. So that's the first big problem. The second big problem is that we have too many digital islands that the, the pace of change in terms of technology uh, is way ahead of governments in terms of the law and also the regulators as well. And what that's evolved into is lots of digital islands lots of fragmented systems operating across uh, the digital ecosystem. None of those processes and systems talk to each other, which means the documents and information can't flow. And that's happening across government systems as well as private sector systems. And so there's a real opportunity to establish a standardized ecosystem where information can effectively flow between private sector and government and vice versa. Just to put some, some numbers on the context here, there are about 27 documents, trade documents, that companies can be dealing with. Uh, and, and sometimes up to 35 government agencies, by the way, dealing with cross borders. That's a lot of processes and systems. So it shouldn't be a surprise that, that, that a trade transaction can take up to two to three months and it can cost up to $80,000 per trade transaction. That's hugely expensive and clearly a barrier for SMEs. The good news is, is we can bring those costs down quite dramatically. We published, uh, ICC published a, a G7 business case uh, for what's called legal reform and legal harmonization. And that means effectively updating our laws, our national legal systems, and then aligning them to what's called the UNCITRAL model law and electronic transferable records, MLETR it's called. If the G7 do that, that will deliver nine trillion in additional trade growth by 2026. It will cut trade transaction costs by 80 plus percent. It will cut border compliance processing times from 25 days to one day, and it will deliver half the trade finance gap. That trade finance gap, by the way, is 1.7 trillion. So globally, we're talking about 85 billion in terms of a solution. So it, the, the numbers are dramatic. Um, and those numbers correlate with other business cases we're developing, both for the UK, we've done, Germany, we've done, we're doing the Commonwealth as well at the moment, which is 54 countries developed and developing. They're all saying the same thing. And that's in a way why governments are getting excited about this particular area. So what are we actually asking governments to do? Quite simply, in the case of the uh, UK and Turkey, the UK is already moving forward. There is a new law on coming through or coming into Parliament early 2022. We expect that law to come into force in, 20, in the middle of 2022. And what that means is we can handle all trade documentation in digital form. It means we can align our economy or our, our, our processes and systems up to the likes of Singapore, and then information can, can flow. But what we're really looking for is more countries to do this at scale. So the, the ICC has a call to action to all governments to reform and align legal frameworks. The G7 is calling for the same. Uh, the proposal to align uh, uh, legal frameworks is back on the table at the WTO uh, e-commerce negotiations. Uh, that's a big deal. And then the Commonwealth countries will be calling for the same at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting next year. What does this mean? Why is this important to Turkey? For the simple reason that actually Turkey ought to be uh, a real fast adopter here. It's got a good history uh, of, of trade. It's got a good history of, of being at the front end of uh, modern trading systems. And so there's a real opportunity here for Turkey to align to the UK. There's obviously a lot of trade between the two countries. But what it means is that Turkey can come and join a fairly exclusive group and, and, and, and uh, capitalize on the benefits that I've been setting out. 
And then in parallel to legal reform, the other big issue, of course, is interoperability. How do we develop an interoperable system? Uh, and where I'll point you to is the ICC Digital Standards Initiative. That's based in Singapore. That now for the International Chamber of Commerce is the home for all work on standardization uh, and legal reform. They are already working with all the major industry groups around the table. There are four digital standards already in, in uh, uh, being agreed. Those include digital identities, foundational ISO documents, title documents, electronic bills of lading. Uh, why is this important? Because we're now asking industry to begin the process of reviewing their, their systems uh, and adopting those standards into their systems um, so that everybody can enable uh, or capitalize on the benefits uh, that I set out in the business case. And to put this in context, in 2013, the WTO agreed the trade facilitation agreement. That was all about making customs and trade facilitation easier. Uh, and the global benefit of doing so would be 15% cut in trade transaction costs. Here we're talking about an 80% cut. So clearly for SMEs and small businesses, this is dramatic. This is the by far and the best way that we bring more companies into the trading system. And certainly between big economies like the UK and Turkey, we should be really moving this forward so that the flow of information can work in digital form and then we can capitalize on the benefits. And obviously that will have a tremendous amplification effect for other economies in both our respective regions, well, either end of the, the, the European region, if, if uh, I can put it in those terms. So that's, the, that's the, the area of opportunity. And to put this in context of climate change we've been talking about earlier on, digitalization, it was, shouldn't be a surprise that we were talking a lot about digitalization at COP, um, simply because it's seen as the enabler. Uh, and in the context of legal reform, for all governments now in a tight fiscal space where there isn't a lot of room to move, uh, there's not a lot of money around to fund big schemes and projects, this is actually a zero cost activity that will deliver an enormous amount of gain. So from business point of view, in terms of being pragmatic, practical, solutions focused, making that trade environment much, much easier for companies to operate in, this is by far and away the number one priority. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. I mean, staggering numbers and great insights. Um, so, um, Ensuring sustainable value chains and environmental, social, and governance reporting are becoming increasingly important for all stakeholders globally. And ICC has also a voluntary responsible uh, sourcing guide for companies to manage their relationships with the suppliers by taking into account social and environmental aspects into consideration. So could you elaborate what kind of initiatives should be taken to strengthen collaborations in this area to be successful? And what are the key success factors to achieve more responsible value chains from your perspective? Well, you know, ESG, if I can put it in those terms, is, is unquestionably the number one priority. We've been consulting companies all over the world all year. And every single company is saying the same thing in terms of sort of tier one big multinationals. The ESG, the ESG agenda is the big agenda. COVID is obviously the, the problem right in front of us. But the long term challenge is unquestionably about how do we uh, deploy a more sustainable, climate-friendly, inclusive supply chains? And how do you do that um, uh, in, in, in very practical terms? ICC, of course, has this amazing pedigree and history of being a rule-making body. Uh, you know, it's, I always call it, describe it as the engine room of ICC, this amazing rule book that covers everything from intellectual property to disputes to trade um, uh, to, to the movement of finance. And what is that? Why is that important? Because it's not surprising that we're now all focused on sustainability um, and digital, because those two spaces really need uh, or lack, uh, I should say, rules and standards. And so we've got to develop them. Uh, the sourcing guide, you know, is one step towards a bigger picture. The big issue in terms of sustainability is reporting. There are far too many reporting frameworks, 200 plus frameworks that companies are having to, to use. It, it's completely unsustainable in its own right. What we need is a single uh, standardized format so that companies can measure what they're doing, they can measure success, and importantly for everyone outside of those companies, we can actually get coherent standardized information so we know that whether we're moving forwards or backwards or sideways 
or whatever. And I, I mean, I've already mentioned digital, but digital is exactly the same. Um, you know, just it, it's pretty lawless out there in some some areas of the digital economy. We just need to tighten it up, make sure there's good rules and standards so that we can actually measure whether we're uh, going forwards. And that's going to be a huge part of what ICC is going to be doing over the coming years. Well, um, again, thank you very much. These are all great insights. Um, and thanks for attending to our panel. Now, I'd like to give the word to uh, Mr. Smith. Um, as the usage of electronic components increase in different sectors, we see massive disruption in supply chain, as I said before, and material short shortages. The case of the electronic chips in the last two years clearly showed us both the importance <coughs> of supply chain resiliency and the need for flexibility when critical industries are hit hard. I mean, take automotive, um, uh, it's, it's really crazy right now. You have recently carried out a study on the development of supply chain links in the manufacturing industry between Turkey and the UK in the post-Brexit world. We are looking forward to your presentation on uh, the general structure of this study and the main outcomes in the terms of the electronic and electronics. I also want to ask, considering the outcomes of the report, um, uh, do you plan to take any initiative in the short and medium term to increase the effectiveness of the trade and investment links between two countries, Turkey and the UK, particularly in regards uh, to electric and electronics industry, and of course, uh, to maintain the supply uh, security uh, resiliency. Um, so if you can share our thoughts with us, that would be great. Yeah, okay, I, thank you for that. Um, from, from my perspective, it's probably better that I start my presentation and some of those questions that you've just asked will be, uh, will hopefully be answered. Just bear with me. Can you see the first slide? Yep, clearly. Okay. Well, first and foremost, uh, thanks for inviting me to this event. Um, I'm going to be providing a little bit of an insight into the uh, Department of International Trade, where I'm a specialist advisor, um, with an overview of the advanced manufacturing, the Midlands engine region, where uh, I've actually worked with, and, uh, and of course, a look at the PricewaterhouseCooper analysis in Turkey document that was, uh, that was made earlier this year. What's important in the innovation cycle, um, things move quickly, as we can as we can see that uh, everything's fast moving and getting increasingly increasingly shorter waves of innovation cycles. They'll continue to get shorter as the emerging technologies evolve. But personally, I picked sort of the four key drivers: diversification, smart manufacturing, evolving new evolving technologies, and there's many of them as we'll see. Um, and the drive to net zero. Each one is probably a huge subject on its own right, and each one is evolving and developing picture, and therefore an area for significant innovation, disruption, and of course, opportunity. Um, I also feel that the UK with its highly developed manufacturing economy and heritage of innovation will act as a test bed for a lot of these new technologies across all sectors following the new trends in manufacturing. I say this because the UK manufacturing sector is revered the world over for its creativity and innovation, and we have a thriving infrastructure for R&D and technical development. I'll quickly go over this, but basically what is advanced manufacturing is the use of innovative technologies and methodologies for improved competitiveness in the manufacturing sectors. We cover automotive, aerospace, rail, renewables, medtech, commercial, electronics and control systems, and many, many others. Um, but there's some things that are developing into new industries on their own, additive manufacturing, automation and robotics, future mobility, construction, all have got their own um, parts that we really do need to look at in detail as, as our previous guest just spoke about. Um, but particularly EV, EV and fuel cell strategies, connected car technology, chain, uh, charging infrastructures, driver assistance, driverless vehicles, all brand new stuff that we, uh, we're learning and we're employing within our, within our SMEs and tier ones and tier twos. 
The aim of using the advanced manufacturer is to improve the OEE of the businesses, quality, reliability and maintainability, flexibility, of course, speed to market. And that's just, that's speed in many uh, instances. That's speed uh, on the marketing side, of course, but also speed to make changes. Improving the cost performance, capital spends, life cycle costs, and you can read the rest, obviously, in ergonomics and environmental conditions. Well, I just want to talk now about the Midlands. We're, uh, I work as part of the Midlands engine, and uh, we have a, a number of positive things that I want to speak about. Um, we're obviously a central position. We're in the middle of the country with the two main um, big cities for, for innovation being Birmingham and Nottingham. Well, we're a set, we've got 90% of our population is within four hours of the center of uh, the center of the Midlands engine, which is great for the connectivity of where we want to go. The region has come together in the name of the Midlands engine. This is a partnership made up of local government, local enterprise partnerships, universities and businesses who all have a single goal of driving economic growth but also the region has size and scale to compete globally. It's the UK's largest regional economy outside London and contributes 240 billion of GVA annually to the UK. With a population of over 11 million and its youngest pop, one of the youngest population, we've got over 20 universities, three of the top UK's, three of the UK's top research institutions, which I'll talk a little bit, bit more about, we have a strong population of young individuals and uh, that fulfill their R&D capacity. Um, the other thing that we've got is two of the eight new um, proposed free ports are going to be within our region. East Midlands Airport is already there and then there's a new one going up on the Humber side because our region goes from Wales all the way across to the coast on the um, on the eastern side of the country. We're also proud as a region, by the way, that we have the, uh, the 2022 Commonwealth Games coming to Birmingham. So hopefully you'll all be able to get across. So we've got some of the, some big companies, uh, obviously Rolls-Royce, Aston Martin, JCB, they're all sort of household names, Alstom. And then in the, uh, in the south of the region, we've got a, a superb, um, a collection of Formula One and motorsport businesses. And then we've got the, some of the food, top food and drink companies, obviously Cadbury's and Walker's Crisps. Europe's largest rail clust clusters in Derby, 240 plus, sorry, 250 plus rail focused businesses, um, that, it, that it's growing, it's a busy sector, um, very uh, important sector to the region. Um, we've also got the Midlands accounts for 40% of all UK automotive production. One and a half billion of UK, um, sorry, we have one and a half billion of UK based automotive R&D spent in the region. Those are figures from a couple of years ago. We've got world-class universities, as I previously mentioned, and innovation centres for advanced manufacturing. Um, if you're familiar, we have a thing called the catapult, the high value manufacturing catapult. And there's seven or eight of these facilities up and down the country, but we have two huge ones in the, in the Midlands. MTC, based in Coventry, which is the Manufacturing Technology Centre, and Warwick Manufacturing Group, which is part of the University of Warwick. Um, and these guys are, they're, they're creating a new dynamic between OEMs and SMEs in uh, technology, collaboration and partnership. Um, obviously the, the, the drive to zero emissions and end of life innovation is largely on their agenda. Developing and proving innovative, sustainable manufacturing processes and technologies in an agile, low risk environment in partnership with industry, academia and inst other institutions. The focus on delivering bespoke manufacturing system solutions to industry. Um, they're continually working um, solidly with some of the major OEMs. They've got big, big facilities in terms of uh, some of the new technologies out there. 
And if you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see how they actually get there for, if people are familiar with technology readiness levels, these guys work from TRL1 through to TRL9. And what that means is they're going from experimental research through applied research and development, and then looking at technology implementation and, in, and industrialization. Um, it's very important that, um, that the, these activities take place. And many, many, many, many different funding routes that uh, the universities take through government and private business. They're continually busy, they're continually expanding, um, and they're, they're, they're striving to be the best and they are the best. Um, there's plenty of other uh, universities and innovation centres for advanced manufacturing in the region, from Nottingham all the way down the list, you can read yourselves. We've got a, a new UK battery industrialisation centre that's just opened up in uh, the, the north of the East Midlands. Um, <clears throat> the Motor Industry Research Association, which has been there for quite a while and is currently working on some projects with the uh, Turkish business. Um, we've just launched, recently launched, it's not fully completed as yet, but the Midlands Universities Portal, which I think when it's complete, which is in, I believe, a few weeks time, it'll give you a, an insight of what our universities are doing, what they're offering to the SMEs, and how they can, and how they can work with uh, international businesses as well. So now going on to the, the, uh, the, the the Price Waterhouse um, package that was looked at a few weeks, a few months ago. The essential eight technologies that represent the future of manufacturing. And I think through this um, presentation and event, we've talked a lot about a lot of these, but artificial intelligence, augmented reality, blockchain, drones, internet of things, robotics, virtual reality, 3D printing, Businesses have been overtaken by these disruptive technologies, integrating modern smart technologies into their day-to-day -day practices and becoming data-driven. And it's not just picking individual ones. A lot of businesses now are, are being forced down the, con the convergence route, and they're looking at maybe two, three, four of those things at the same time, um, which is enabling them to, to, to move forward in the digital world. Um, I, I'm not, I don't intend to go through each one of those, but as you, as you can see, there's a, for, for people who will be picking it up through either LinkedIn or, or want copies of it, it gives you a good uh, context of what each of those um, disruptions or disruptive parts will, will, will means about and, and where they're affecting where the, the business is going. So I'll, I will quickly skip over that, but it's worth a read in detail to find out exactly where they're going. The paths rarely free of obstacles. Lots and lots of changes going on. All manufacturers and most businesses face that sort of ongoing external challenges shown on the top half of the slide. Then along came COVID and changed everything overnight. Supply chains in particular faced unprecedented disruption and uncertainty. Business in, businesses not only had to take action to address these disruptions, but also forge a path to recovery and resilience in order to ensure business continuity. Non-traditional approaches were needed to adjust to the new reality. In light of all this disruption, an overarching theme emerged being that business operations are being overtaken by disruptive technologies. The industrial ecosystem has redesigned itself sorry, resigned, sorry, resigned itself to the reality that in order to remain robust, competitive and sustainable, disruptive technologies are rapidly emerging as the defining set of trends to adopt for companies, industries and competitors. One of the things you've seen on there is that uh, the, the supply disruption, supply shortages, interruptions and delays due to closed factories, factories with workforce and supply challenges, supplier bankruptcies. Um, I think that's what uh, we were talking about earlier. Um, 
reduce sales in, in effective areas, unforeseeable buying behaviour driven by the news, media and governmental conditions we've, we've seen. You know, the lack of toilet rolls as soon as the media might make that uh, the whole infrastructure of our, of our life changes as we, uh, as we see shortages. And then from there, going forward, we've seen trucks and, um, and obviously a lot of, a lot of skill shortages within, uh, within the UK, I'm sure across the world. Regarding the electrical equipment and electronics, the analysis shows that we should channel manufacturing efforts towards products whose product complexity, PCI scores, have increased in the past decade, i.e. products that have are situated in the upper and right hand quadrants of uh, the graph that I'm showing. Um, developing know-how and specialization in these increasingly complex products as an investment would be advantageous in terms of increased value add and competitiveness in the medium and long term. Matching those capabilities of the Midlands engine region to, those, to the Turkish firms in the context of the complex products is a great strategy to pursue. Advanced technologies could be provided by companies and research institutes within the Midlands region. We're geared to actually do that. Um, there are, if you take one of the elements on there, electric motors and generators, we have numerous businesses um, that have started up or have expanded into electric motors and generators that are going real high tech um, and are looking for partnerships, are looking to work and collaborate with, with businesses in Turkey. So there's some there's plenty of opportunities there in each one of those segments that, that, that are shown on the screen. And these, this graph is taken directly from the PwC analysis. Developments along global supply chains have made disruptive technologies a necessity for many companies. The, from manufacturers to suppliers, to distributors, to customers, the 360 degree supply chain data network is now a critical feature. Real time tracking and traceability, end to end supply chain visibility, for example, inventory capacity planning, the cost to serve visibility accurately through the steps enabling end-to-end -end collaboration, optimization, norm, I think, in businesses, uh, progressive businesses in the future. Um, and we can jointly sort of uh, enable that within the, the, the Turkish framework as well. Yeah, very, very much, very much the same. Uh, with, with this backdrop, the project logical framework was founded upon four of these main phases and reached through the realization of a deep dive analysis. We've got to, we've got to be able to plan and execute um, very, very accurately. So you're going from predictive maintenance um, through to predictive prescriptive scenarios, predictive routing through the logistics side and predictive management. It's, it's been able to connect all of those aspects through uh, through digitalization. Um, so you end up working with from, from, from supplier through the material hub, manufacturing assembly, distribution site, channel partners, end customers, all being able to be fully connected. And I think we, we mentioned on one of the earlier slides, um, the speed to market, the speed speed to change, the speed of accurate decision-making, makes that connectivity the, the project manager's most important thing that he can look at, and obviously um, to, to make all our businesses profitable. Predictive maintenance on machines, talking to the inventory stores, making sure that the X amount of machine cycles, the parts available. Machines talking to other machines, talking to other parts of the business. Smart order management, automatically ordering, if not in current inventory, planning the most efficient way of getting that part to plant. Having continuous real-time sensing and tracking and keep to keep the OEE at its most optimum. So th there's an awful lot of work to be done. 
Um, but that's the implementation strategies that um, both PwC and in my previous jobs, that's what we've done and been working on for, for a number of years. Um, with this backdrop, the, the project's logical framework was founded upon four main phases. Um, we need to have a really good look laying the groundwork for further primary data collection and trade and competitive analysis. Competitive assessment, making sure that we are, uh, we are competitive and that Turkey and the UK Midlands capabilities can, are of a, of a compar comparative and, and also got a, a, a good competitiveness um, alignment. Stakeholder views, making sure that we talk to everybody that's involved and the consolidation of the literature review um, making sure that the competitiveness assessment stakeholder views are reported on. Very important that we, all this uh, information in the new world is reported accurately. Again, digital framework will help us do that. Deep dive, a deep dive into the detailed analysis of advanced, of, of advanced engineering and manufacturing technologies. Um, closely linked by all the others, an analysis of the, the market in specific se sectors with global value chains and successful competitive investigation. And um, that's again, that's in in very important. Business intelligence is, in, is gonna be important for moving forward and staying um, competitive. Design of surveys and a potential stakeholder list for potential interest budgets for advanced manufacturing technologies. And then a consolidation of the analysis conducted and reported on steps. And again, that's very important because the um, the reporting will enable us to have the continuous improvement, trying to get things gone right, things gone wrong, and, and making sure that we, we put it right if it has gone wrong. The overview of the, of the findings are uh, quite, quite strong, really. The, the, the general consensus of the PwC report of machinery companies in terms of advanced manufacturing technologies to prioritize is Internet of Things technologies followed by 3D printing and endeavors relating to additive manufacturing. Um, based on the experience during the COVID-19 epidemic or pandemic, sorry, Companies have stated that they realise the importance of diversifying their supply chains and their supplier portfolio in particular in order to have alternative suppliers and minimise risk. None of the companies have mentioned explicit contract with UK shareholders. However, several companies, representatives, were part of a task force negotiating origin protocol and the custom processes within the context of the newly signed UK trade agreement with Turkey. Uh, the number of suppliers who are on the UK origin are relatively few, even with a, with a, with a firm that has 2000 suppliers from 55 different countries. Um, we have to improve that, of course. Most companies are at the average level of sophistication when it comes to the digitization of their quality procedures and processes. The majority of companies need to update their data dynamics, production processes and maintenance processes capabilities in the context of digitization. Domestic and smaller firms are more in need of upgrading their supply chain processes. So a lot of work to do, but um, I think we have the, the knowledge and the, and the desire to do it. Designating manufacturing industries have been classified in terms of their strategic impact and the viability of the UK stakeholders to being a stronghold in the Turkish market. And those came down to electronics and electrics, um, machinery, and then ones that have already sort of got a high impact collaboration to, between the two countries of automotive and aerospace and defence. So the, the, the two big ones there, Machinery currently dominated by uh, EU-based procurement, particularly Germany, um, which we can start to fix because um, we want to sh shift that towards the UK. And the electronics and electrics, highly import dependent with most um, coming from Eastern Asia, but potential UK collaborators 
may achieve success in penetrating this market if we concentrate on collaboration focused research and commercialization with the um, high catapult businesses um, that I talked about earlier. Um, when asked about areas of prioritization um, in, in the questions and answers uh, portion of the document, as, as almost always, um, price is important um, along with quality. And that's, uh, that's not changed during this, um, this um, structured look at what PwC did. So re results for the assessment of the 11 advanced technological trends inform UK Midlands institutions focus areas. Um, uh, basically all the things that we spoke about, uh, trends that will have an eye impact on the manufacturing industry, whose adaptability is low in Turkey, according to the survey results. So an average of all the answers indicate that the survey participants believe 3D printing, connected manufacturing, Internet of Things and robotics are the technologies that will have the highest impact on the industries. However, firms in Turkey find that the current capabilities in connected manufacturing, Internet of Things, 3D printing, are in need of improvement. We definitely can work with these guys to uh, improve the, all those conditions. Uh, thank you very much for your time. I've probably overstepped my time, Mark, but uh, I do apologise for that. But if I have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, uh, it, it certainly is an interesting study. And, and there is, it looks like there's some homework to do, but I believe the time to yeah. present uh, both countries a great opportunity. Of course, in electric and electronic sector, Far East is by far the, uh, you know, the biggest supplier to both countries actually. But yeah. with the disruption that we are seeing right now, I, I think we better do our, our homework and, and, and, and significantly increase cooperation in this, in this area. At least that's, that's my take uh, from your uh, presentation as well. So thank you very much. Sure. So, um, uh, Mr. Dinchev, um, if I can give the word to you, the Turkey has the world's second largest white goods production capacity following China and has surpassed many countries within the European Union. So what has led Turkish white goods industry to this global su success? How will the near trade environment affect uh, our manufacturing and business activities in the future, and what do you see as the main challenges? Okay, uh, good afternoon, first of all, to everybody, and thank you, Mr. Raghav, to let us to be a part of this lovely event. Uh, let me give you some figures for White Goods Association in Turkey. As you mentioned, we become number two after China, uh, mainly, uh, I think there are, we represent not only the white goods manufacturing and also some global retail uh, brands also in Turkey. And we had the uh, lovely a brand from UK as well, one of our uh, association in Turkey. Uh, we have the very strong manufacturing facilities in Turkey, very, very modern, very young, I can say this. And uh, we, we have the 60,000 personnel and 600,000 with indirect in our industry. Uh, so, uh, and uh, we managed to export more than 160 different countries worldwide. And 70% uh, of our production is exporting. And uh, from these figures, the uh, European Union is also, and UK is our main partner, I can say, 75% of our total manufacture going to the Europe and the UK. So uh, this is very important figures, uh, just a few tips to you. And uh, of course, thanks to the European Union, uh, custom union, let's say, we become the, the major manufacturer and the exporter worldwide. Uh, I, I can say last I mean, time- We should include the UK to that as well, John, don't we? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah, I mean, back, the main... back when the UK was part of this customs union, of course, now we have a better uh, a trade agreement, of course. I will would, I would give that numbers to 16% of our uh, production is going to UK. I mean, these are the tremendous numbers. How is show how is solid uh, relation between UK and the Turkey? 
So what we learned in the pandemic, I mean, uh, the time, despite the COVID-19 pandemic condition with the support of our suppliers and the agile working capabilities, our total manufacturing volume reached to almost 30 million major uh, appliances. Uh, in John, John, Bey, John Bey, excuse me. Uh, uh, Bill, uh, you're still sharing your screen. Uh, can you stop sharing? Mr. Smith? Just bear with me. And otherwise, we will be reading all your emails, Bill. <laughs> thank you thank you sorry sorry john Bay. Yeah, no problem thank you and uh, uh, of course of course if i briefly mention the main strengths of our industry which is the uh, one of the major industry in turkey i may say this is export oriented uh, production globally known brands all the top brands we produce and we export from turkey uh, competitive supplier ecosystem I mean, all our major supply is also located in Turkey and it's give us a big chance to reflect the uh, consumer demands, sharp uh, changing in their demands. So it's also a very important advantage of Turkey. And we, we are close to the markets, very close, as you can see. And we, we don't depend on only see, we have a, we have a uh, with the trucks we can export. So lots of variety we can use. And of course, high R&D capability we have. And the finally, uh, the most important, the uh, human resources. Very talented, very well-educated uh, personnel, the young generation in Turkey are ready to, to increase more production and export uh, to UK as well. So in the coming periods, I mean, to put in the context, I think the climate actions and the maintaining long-term sustainability goals related to the environment will be our heart of our business. By positioning the Green Deal and the ambition of carbon neutral at the heart of recovery, the uh, UK and the, the, all the other members of Europe is shaping all these legislation frameworks towards a greener economy. In order to benefit the much of this potential in these areas, it's critical to follow trends very closely and develop the ability to provide environment friendly, high tech products and services that provide added value uh, customer. Uh, this is the reason we insist uh, the green economy, greener uh, products in our Turkey uh, production facilities. And I do hope we will do our homework uh, much better than other countries, and we will be contribute to UK uh, green economy as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, uh, I believe our proximity uh, with the UK, the uh, historical trade relationships, the opportunities that the green economy will present us, uh, and and all the other attributes uh, that you uh, mentioned uh, about the uh, sector and uh, our, our, our you know production abilities uh, will will give us great opportunities to enhance the business. So I would like to move on to our last panelist, uh, Mr. Kerem Özdoğan. Um, so, uh, Mr. Özdoğan, uh, UK is the biggest export market for the uh, Turkish electronic, electric electronic industry. Uh, we heard that from John and as well. FDA yeah. between Turkey and the UK secured the es essence of no tariff trade partnership. So we would like to hear your views on how the new level of partnership will evolve in terms of your industry perspective. Can you please elaborate on the potential opportunities to strengthen bilateral relations in the post-Brexit era, as well as ways to eliminate the supply risks and build more resilient supply chains? So um, uh, if you can do this very briefly, I would be glad um, uh, being the last panel. <laughs> Apologies for that. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. It's okay, Mr. Valjoli. I appreciate for the for your wording. Uh, and I'm, I'm aware of the pressure on me now, uh, being the last presenter. So I have already eliminated some of my presentations so far. Uh, the ones that were already mentioned by the participants. So I will, I will make it very brief and quick. 
so hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kerem Özdoğan. I'm a board member of uh, Turkish Electrical and Elect Electronics Exporters Association. Uh, and I would like to extend my greetings to all distinguished uh, panelists here and all the British and Turkish uh, audience and business community watching us online. Uh, I will make a very brief presentation, as I mentioned. Uh, it's not only it's not because I don't want to show myself, uh, but I feel that we have some important and interesting numbers that are more effective when, it, when they are visual. So let me start my sharing. So, yep, uh, this is my presentation. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, first, our association is founded uh, on 1991 with more than 6,000 members uh, right now. Uh, and we are representing almost 7% of the total export of Turkish business. Uh, and we have achieved $11.3 billion uh, at the end of 2020. Uh, and we are exporting more than 200 countries so far. And the uh, important KPI, I believe, is that our uh, kilogram rate for, for the sales is like $5.14, uh, which is the biggest amount in, in Turkish export. So let's move forward. As you can see, uh, 2019 was $11.5 billion for our association, of course, only. Uh, although there was COVID in two, two, 2020, we were almost uh, around the same uh, level of uh, sales. Uh, at the end of Q3 this year, we have already re uh, achieved $10.5 billion. So we can say that we are targeting like $14 billion at the end of this year which is a very uh, good number and like uh, 20, 30 percent increase in our sales, which is very significant, I believe. Uh, what about the figures? Uh, being a member of European Union, I'm talking about UK, at the end of 2020, uh, we were making our export uh, 61 percent of our export to European Union which is followed by uh, near and Middle East and other European countries by 15% and 11%. So UK was the, a part of this 61% share. But after Brexit, of course, uh, the figure is that UK is representing 14% market share for Turkish electrical electronics exporters. Uh, followed by Germany by 10%, 7% by France, and Italy and Spain 4% each. And they're all followed by Iraq and Israel, of course. So UK is the biggest market for, for Turkish electronic uh, and electrical uh, manufacturers. See the numbers uh, in terms of the segmentation, TV receivers, Cables, installation cables, low voltage energy cables, washing machines, refrigerators and coolers, and ovens and cookers uh, are the main uh, idea. And at the end of uh, Q3, we are already reached to $1.5 million uh, export uh, this year. So this is very uh, significant increase for Turkish export to UK. So we have already passed the limit, all time record we are talking about. Uh, what about the other side? Uh, Turkish import from UK is like $300 million by the end of Q3 this year, which is again increasing, almost with the same rate, we can say. So what about the added value here? Uh, we are talking about high-tech products, uh, which, are, which is 16%, and mi uh, medium and high-tech exports, which is 83% of our uh, exports, which is already above the targets defined in our 
11th development plan uh, targeting 2023. So we are talking about some high tech here. What about the, the areas that we can cooperate? Uh, of course, as already mentioned in our development plan uh, in, for, for 2023, we can talk about 5G technology plus the, the rest of communication, machine to machine, uh, hardware and software and IoT systems. Of course, the classical machinery, elevators, air conditioning, uh, silicon sheet is one of our targets because electrical motors are increasing, the demand is increasing with electrical cars and such. So we should be independent from, uh, for, for these kind of critical uh, materials uh, that are required for our, for our manufacturing, of course. Accumulators, batteries, and that kind of storage systems are so famous so far. And of course, smart. Uh, life uh, brings white goods and home appliances to become smart. So what about the challenges? It's a very resource intensive sector. Uh, you cannot go and buy some stuff uh, without uh, digging deep. Uh, and we are talking about some uh, lots of valuable metals like iron, copper, steel, even gold, uh, chrome, zinc, and of course, some rare earth elements too. And it, as, as we have seen after, after the COVID-19 hit the world economy, a shift towards the circular economy is, is, is on the table right now. And with the COP26 and all the, all the green talking as, as we have done so far, waste collection and management is one of the key challenges ahead of our uh, manufacturers. But uh, with regards to our advantages, uh, Turkey is already a member of customs union, was the customs union in terms of UK business. But again, we are still a part of the European Union uh, supply chain, which can still be integrated to UK uh, rules and legislations. Uh, of course, and we are ready, uh, we have already completed our uh, ISO certification, Roche directives and uh, REACH regulations as such, so the change shall be minimal. Uh, when we come to the FTA, free trade, free trade agreement between Turkey and UK, it's, it, it, it, it was, it's still covering the goods trade. So we feel that uh, it, should be, it will be perfect if we can expand the coverage to investments, uh, digitalization and services se sectors. Uh, and when we have the FTA, because of the uh, World Organization, uh, World Trade Organization, bilateral accumulation of the origin principle is a little a stressful threat on our businesses because uh, the country of origin uh, of the goods that are on, on, on our subject right now shall have a small threat, so it needs to be worked on for this subject. Uh, UKCA repla replacing a C certificate. Uh, it's of course we, we, we respect that, but we feel that if we can uh, make a cooperation between Turkish Standard Institute and UK uh, Certification Institute, it will reduce the costs and the time spent to get the certification. And one another comment from some suppliers that we have collected so far, that the construction product regulation CPR uh, is, I mean, which is enforced recently needs to be simplified because they, they have found that there are some differences in different clauses of CPR. So we need a little work on it again. So what about the, the, the businesses that we can cooperate? Uh, renewable energy, of course, in which both sides in need of. Uh, smart home, live cities, mobility, and that kind of. This is the production, including health and wellness uh, is very important. And it's the, it's the future business uh, in 2050s, we feel, we, we feel. 
and of course electrical vehicles and charging systems uh, there are already mentioned rules and changes in the legislations so far so it's happening in turkey at the moment in parallel so we should adapt ourselves with the changing rules and uh, laws by the way so that's that's it from me for for the moment and i hope it was quick enough uh, mr baljeolu and i'm ready for any questions that that may arise Thank you very much, Kerem Bey. Mr. Erzdoğan, uh, that concludes actually uh, our presentation. Uh, in terms of questions and answers, in the interest of time, I, I propose that all uh, questions are posted uh, to our forum and uh, Aycan can let everyone know how you, you know uh, uh, questions can uh, ask. Uh, you can write to the chat as well. But uh, we will uh, return with the answers. We will come back with the answers uh, after this uh, event. So thank you very much again, Kerem Bey. And uh, thank you all distinguished uh, speakers and all participants for bearing with us, uh, sharing your uh, uh, very valuable views, insights, and thoughts. Uh, and we have, uh, I can say that we have covered quite a lot of ground uh in two and a half hours uh that uh, you know where we have uh, gone through and uh, and i hope everyone uh, have uh, taken um, a, a homework or uh, a to do or an insight valuable insight from this uh, conference from this webinar so thank you very much for bearing with us and thank you very much for participating osman bey Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And uh, have a great week. Uh, and uh, we hope uh, uh, the trade and investments between our two countries uh, develop over the years to come. And uh, we certainly will work for that as the Turkey UK Business Council. And thank you for joining again. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you.